Hello and welcome to another edition of the Rest is Entertainment Questions Edition. I am Marina Hyde. I'm Richard Osman. Uh, welcome to the Questions and Answers so, And Answers, podcast. and Answers. It's so crucial. Every week there will be answers. Now, let me kick off for you, Richard, with a question from Thomas Lane. I want to know this as well. How do TV shows that film in advance stop their contestants from giving away anything on social media? Examples like Bake Off, MasterChef, The Professionals, Traitors. It would be really easy for one contestant to give away the ending accidentally or on purpose. It's a really, really good question. And funny enough, when I looked at the question, I was thinking, do you know what? It's quite tricky to, to give the answer. Different shows do different things, but by and large, you're actually relying on goodwill. With The Traitors, Harry was obviously not getting paid until the show goes out. So it's in his interest to not give that away. So you have contracts saying you can't give something away, but there's you, you, you know you can't enforce a contract if. I mean, what are you going to do? Fine, Andrew. He, you know? No, yeah, he actually said he actually broke the rules and told his dad and his girlfriend, and it was about five a.m. I thought, oh yeah, you've gone out, had a big night, and just thought, oops, I'm just going to say. And his dad opened a bottle of prosecco at five in the morning. Harry's Harry's dad probably ten years younger than both of us. Yes. So with someone like Harry, it's easy because he doesn't want to break that contract with other contestants. Some shows will give a little runners-up prize that's not mentioned on air, which only gets paid as and when you get through. Um, there would be situations where lots of people go on these shows. Apprentice would be a good example for exposure, yeah, and you know to get some sort of contract with you know um, various people, and that they need quite a lot of goodwill from the production company and the channel for that to happen. So you know if you've been on The Apprentice and you know you want to work on the BBC and you give away the ending of The Apprentice then you're not going to get that um, job. The Apprentice, actually, I don't think they still do this, but they always used to film two endings where he hired both of them. So even the people who won oh, wow. did not know they'd won until they watched the episode. So, you know, which is a, a good way of keeping things secret. I also don't know this, but I know how newspapers and things work, which is that if they did know who won it, they would keep it totally secret because there's no better way of pissing off your readers than exactly. to spoil the show. So it, you kind of, it, it's a little bit safe on that side too. But even it's not just contestants. So you could tell with the traitors when they did the spin-off show or anything with an audience, there's a whole studio audience who know what's happened and they don't give it away either so they will all sign a thing saying i'm not able to give this away but you know yeah i mean what are you going to do it's given away it's given away uh, yeah. but people don't so strictly usually if you really want to search for it don't search for it because it will ruin everything there's a spoiler before the sunday night show because someone in the audience on the saturday or someone somewhere around the show on the saturday will be able to tell you who got kicked out the lovely news about it is because i think whoever was doing the strictly spoiler was monetizing it somehow that everyone started doing their own Strictly Spoiler website. So actually, it's sort of impossible to find out which is the real Strictly Spoiler, which is quite good news. There's so much. That's one of the rare occasions where disinformation is incredibly useful. But by and large, you're relying on goodwill. If you do a quiz show, if you do Pointless, anything like that, if you do House of Games, don't put anything on social media until the show goes out. If you're ever watch, if there's ever a big celebrity show on and you want to know who wins. Just go on Twitter and see whose tweet is saying, yeah, I'm on uh, Dancing on Ice tonight. I um, hope you guys can catch it because they're only saying that if they won. Yeah. But but by and large, honestly, usually it's just sort of goodwill and everyone plays the game and plays fair. And if you look after people properly on shows and if they've enjoyed themselves, then they will do that. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. That's quite heartwarming. Let's move on to our next question. Sophie Fisher asks, my question is, why are films made for Netflix, etc., so long? What is the benefit to streaming services to produce longer shows? Is it with a view to introducing ad breaks, which we talked about a little on uh, We on did. Tuesday. I, I don't think it's to do with um, introducing ad breaks. This is a very good question. First of all, they want to keep you on the platform. They also think you're watching it at home, so you can probably get through a three-and-a-half-hour movie over three nights or you can stop and make cups of tea and all those things. But actually... Genuinely, the main, main reason is because they needed to attract creators to the platform and they just told them they could do whatever they wanted. And if they had made it for a different studio, would have been told to get their movie down under two hours or two hours ten at tops, were suddenly making three hours and ten minutes. And, I mean, I was actually speaking to someone who'd spoken to... Mike Lee about he'd done Peter Lou for them. He said, this is fantastic. You can do whatever you want. They've let me do whatever I want. Well, I don't know if you've seen it, but it is much too long and it could have benefited from someone saying this should be shorter. And people, creators who all thought, you know, always think they know best, but actually part of the whole ecosystem in which they work is someone editing and saying, I actually think we need to get this under a certain thing. It's not commercial at this length. It's not, you know, it's too long. There's too many woolly bits. I know you love it, but you need to be told. Someone needs to tell you. Well, for a long time at places like Netflix or maybe even Amazon, 
They didn't tell them. No one told them. They needed the creators to come to their platforms because they were suspicious of the streamers. They wanted to stay with old studios. So what, part of the creative offer was like, basically, you can do what you want. And you make it as long as you want. And there's very few creatives who, are, if they were given two hours or three hours, it would take two hours. Yeah. And an impressively short answer as well, Marina. Yes, um, we've curtailed ourselves. Yeah, imagine if we'd gone on for 15 minutes yeah. <laughs> about that. <laughs> the problem with creatives is they keep going, going on. and going. This is a really good one and a matter of mass annoyance for people. Leanne Rhodes says, why do so many programmes have a preview of what's coming up before the start of the show and coming up after the break? It infuriates me. Likewise, Leanne. Sometimes they show up so much, I don't even need to watch the programme and I turn over. Uh, Leanne, thank you. From me, thank you from everybody for asking that question. It drives me absolutely up the wall. Those shows where the first minute is, this is what you're about to see in the next bit. Uh, and then even, even then, like halfway through that bit, there'll be like another bit coming up. It'll be the one good line in the whole show, yeah. by the way. And you've, by the time it comes, like th you've heard it three times. You've heard it at the beginning. You've heard it halfway through. You've heard it just after the advert break as well. They do it on property renovation shows. That's the thing. It drives me. The only reason I'm watching your show is you're showing me a rundown farmhouse and at the end I want to see what it looks like. The reveal. Like. And you are showing me in this coming up what it looks like. They you're cannibalise their own content. I just do not understand. Is the audience regarded as so, uh, having such a short attention span that unless you tell them what they're going to see, they're going to wander off? Presumably, yes. But I, what is the evidence for that? Yeah. I don't know any other events other than it's it's a sort of very 15 years ago thing of let's hook people in in the first five minutes. You think that's because otherwise they'll switch over. You think that's those days are gone. Come yeah. on. Dragon's Den, which we just talked about, The Apprentice, they have these, the beginnings of the show that go on for so long. There can't be anybody who's not just fast forwarding through that yeah. on iPlay. They go, uh, imagine the four dragons walk into the den. We know. We well, you know, right? It's like series 40. We know who they are. We know they've gone into the den. Honestly, just start with the first pitch. You think, I can't do this three minutes of stuff. No. Just get, it you... undermines the show and yeah. it insults the audience. So I wish they would stop doing it. And I don't actually believe there's any evidence that it hooks people in and makes them hang around longer. If anything, it, it takes away the, the drama and the, you know, reveals. So exactly I... that. Watch YouTube. They're, they're straight into that stuff. Yeah, I think it's laziness. Also, it's a sort of way of making sort of filler, really. It takes down your 30 minutes or however long your program is and it takes it, you can take four minutes of it with this nonsense. Honestly, I'm I'm already invested. Stop yeah. telling us something crazy is going to happen. And also, oh my God, this is the thing that drives me mad. And actually, there's another question about it, so maybe we'll get on to it. This is a pet peeves edition of the Q&A. <laughs> which is, they, will, they do it on Dragon's Den all the time, which is someone will say something from a pitch, they will then cut to a reaction from a completely different pitch to make it look like something absolutely nuts has happened. I think no, that's not that's not the story of your show. So quit that. Yeah, very good. That's such a good question. Thank you, Liam. Richard, we have had so many questions about Dragon's Den TV fakery that I'm just going to sort of amalgamate them in one. Just to sort of recap for people who might not be aware of this, there was a contestant who, please stop me if I'm getting this wrong, Richard, she was selling something called a £30 Accu ear seed. It's a gold-plated ear seed that she says cured her ME. Now, this has been quite a big scandal. This is sort of, people are saying it's snake oil. And um, I think all six dragons tried to invest yes. in it. And she went with Stephen Bartlett because I think she said that someone had told her she was going to meet an important man called Stephen. <laughs> Ding dong, that's the warning sign. <laughs> anyway, I believe the BBC have now had to take this off off the off iPlayer because there have been obviously a lot of, sort of snake oil claims about it. Mm. They've actually put it back on iPlayer now, but with a tiny edit and also a caption on the screen saying there is no evidence evidence at all that these um, earbuds work, these ear pods work. Ear seeds. Ear seeds, of course. Ear seeds. What am I talking about? I'm an idiot. Of course it's <laughs> ear seeds. Yeah, it's interesting that because obviously there are huge, huge, huge amounts of money to be made in alternative health remedies. And of course, if you're an investor, you would be investing in some of those. Uh, and of course, certain things do work for certain people and the placebo effect works on certain people. So that, listen, it's a multi-billion, billion, billion dollar industry wellness. And there's always something. And if you want to invest in it, if it makes people feel happy, uh, then all well and good. There's obviously a side of that, which is my machine cures cancer, which yeah. is, you know, Wrong. it's illegal and you should go to prison. So 
it's sort of a world in which people would be investing. And the, the interesting thing about Dragon's Den has always been, it's always come out of an entertainment department. It's always an entertainment show. But it, it does have a genuine truth to it somewhere, which is there is a world in which people are looking for investors. These people, the Dragons, are genuine investors. It's their money. They're not getting paid by production to sort of put money in. They do really invest. You know, after the show, of course, there's more due diligence and there's a you know, lots of deals break down, but lots of deals also go through. So it has an awful lot of reality to it. There's a lot of people have been using the phrase TV fakery, which is something yeah. we haven't heard for a I while. Know. But it was a big scandal for Took a back. time back. That it does take you back uh, because people were saying, "Oh, well, she was approached to take part." Yeah. Now that. I don't think that is TV fakery. No, it's not. And that's always how Dragon's Den has worked. You, you'll always get people applying to come on the show with ideas. But, all, you know, you, you're making a TV show. You want to make the best TV show possible. So, you know, you will often, if you're a researcher on that show, a producer on that show, you'll be looking around for young, interesting businesses who maybe have, have not thought about approaching Dragon's Den. You approach them. You say, look... Would you be interested in coming on the show? Are you looking for investment? At what sort of level? You have conversations with them. Most of them will say, this is not for us. But some of them will say, actually, you know, yeah, this is. You know, you could go through a, like a Whole Foods market and you see like there's a marshmallow brand and you think, I'll give them a ring. So, yeah, it's not TV fakery. It's never, you know, lots of people do apply. But equally, you wouldn't be doing your job properly if you weren't looking for interesting businesses. No one is coming along with a fake business that doesn't no. exist. No one is coming along and trying to con people. You know, all the businesses there are real people, real entrepreneurs, and they're pitching to real people. So I, I've never had a, um, a problem with that. I've, I've, I did a few documentaries about Dragon's Den, about the, um, uh, the sort of biggest successes they'd ever have. And it was genuinely such a heartwarming yeah. experience. You're talking to the entrepreneurs who, who, who had, you know, had real businesses, real stories, and the money had really, really helped them grow. Talking to the Dragons who took it very, very, very seriously. And so, yeah, I think it's a pretty solid show, Dragon's Den. As to whether they should have these ear seeds, it's tricky because definitely people making ear seeds are going out looking for investment. That's for sure. And Dragon's Den is a show that hopefully shows what real investment is like. But I do think the BBC probably has to... Get out of the ear seed game. I think probably it does. And listen, when all the you know, peer-reviewed papers are in and ear seeds are, the, yeah. you know, are, are, are proven, then of, of course... Do Leave them. it to Gwyneth Paltrow. I just think there shouldn't be a crossover. Yes, I, I think so. I, I think if something's on the BBC, it, it does give it a certain veneer this of respectability. This is one thing in, like, however many yeah, shows. Yeah, yeah. This is not... Uh, it's interesting talking about telly fakery in general because w w that was seems like such a tame scandal looking back on it. This yeah. is back in the sort of around twenty ten. The, the you know. Blue Peter Cat was yeah. the big one. About, oh my uh, god, Blair Grylls goes in a hotel, and it seems so, we've <laughs> dined out on these stories for weeks, and then it's now like after the sort of political shocks of twenty sixteen, you now feel like saying, yeah, yeah, but wait, the guy who presents U.S. Apprentice, right? He becomes president. <laughs> so you go back and you look at all these really tame stories and think, I mean, do I really care? But because of that, you will notice that in the UK version of the Traitors you have to see them leaving the castle in these black Land Rovers every night and then driving back in in the morning. In the US version of the show, which is shot in exact same castle with the same crew and everything, they just pretend they sleep in the castle. But because yeah. we've had this scandal, we have to show that they're not actually sleeping there. Otherwise, there would be a great big story in the Daily Mail saying, they don't even sleep in the castle. Oh, God, don't. It's like Holmes Under the Hammer, that you know, where you, you used to sort of pretend you just follow people back from the auction. And now it's like, no, it's, it, you just every bit of TV is like, oh, my God, this is like Ed Pohl, which is editorial policy. Yeah. It it's always has its hand on, uh, on, on almost uh, any format these days. So I think, yeah... I think I think probably it was unwise uh, that for for all the people asking, but I I, I think Dragon's Den is 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 pretty ro show. pretty robust. And Gary Neville was on that episode yeah. as well, which was great. Someone had like a like a cinema pod, and he was saying, "I'm going to give you all the money, but only if you can turn it into social housing." <laughs> <laughs> you sure, Gary? I don't know. I, I don't know where that's gone. The big scandal it never really came out was that um, uh, on Blind Date when they used to you only get the choice of holiday at the end, the two envelopes. Yeah. Same thing in both envelopes, you know. But you know, that's, it's like it's t you know, it's TV, isn't it? That's I'm it. Yeah, shocked. Same, same thing, right? Retrospectively, I'm going to make a massive complaint. Can <laughs> you believe it? And then Stella Black became president. Yeah. You know? Can you believe it? Can you believe yeah. it? Yeah. Same so hairdo, I, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Craddock. He says, please settle a running argument between me and my wife. Always, Bill. And it doesn't have to be about television or anything to do with entertainment. Just get in touch with us. Dishwasher. On <laughs> yeah. Do you know what, Bill? She's in the right. I'm so sorry. <laughs> 
on a TV show when the thing happens, the camera cuts to a presenter, fellow contestant, audience member, etc., to get their reaction. Is this a true reaction or is someone editing the footage to splice in reactions from other incidents, even in the case of the presenter, kind of stock reactions on a held tape, you know, a tape yeah. that you might already have? Anything with Greg Wallace in is the pinnacle of this, <laughs> suggests Bill. I mean, anything with Greg Wallace in is the pinnacle of anything. Um, it's a really good question. By and large, you try and avoid that. Uh, as I was just saying, on the start of Dragon's Den, when they're sort of you know, giving you an idea of what's going to happen. They they constantly do it. It's different bits from different episodes. And, you know, that drives me mad. If you're doing something like a panel show, so in a panel show, there's millions of edits because, you know, someone's talking, someone else is talking, you know, you've got cameras on everybody. So, you know, in, in the edit, you've got all the different, you've got the feeds from all the different cameras. We used to call it a quad split. We probably don't anymore. And someone does a joke and you want to come out there and come in slightly later. So they do that joke. Uh, you then have to do a sound edit and someone says something directly after so you haven't got the Im- the immediate reaction of someone laughing. You you might then find that same person laughing in a similar way from later in the show and edit that in to cover that edit point. I see. So you might, you, you, you might do that. What you wouldn't do is do a joke that lands flat and then edit in someone laughing hilariously who didn't laugh in the first place. But you, would, you, 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 don't, you want to be emotionally true to you it. You would find the equivalent yeah. shot. We, we, we did a show years ago where the host would never laugh at anybody. <laughs> okay, so everyone would do jokes and the host would just never laugh. And it, it was a proper issue uh, very early on in the edit. But then you realise during the pickups of the show where everyone's a bit more relaxed, the host was really laughing. You know, yeah. suddenly there was, and so very early in that show, you'd have to just go to the pickups to find shots of the host. Cause other because it looked weird if the host wasn't laughing. And it was just nerves, I think, yeah. was the thing. But so you had to sort of put that in. I think the, the host watched it a few times and go, "Oh, I love it when I laugh." You know, that's yeah, good. Yeah, oh, I should from, do more of that. From that moment on, always laugh. Do you remember? In, that's a plot of broadcast news. Do you remember when one of the news readers, he looks like he's sort of crying in an interview with a rape victim or something, and in fact she was like, and then Holly Hunter works out that there were only what she they only had one camera there that day, so it wasn't possible for him to have got that reaction, and it destroys her view of him. It's regarded as this kind of huge emotional moment because he's faked his two shot and in fact he sort of went back and made himself cry afterwards. Oh, clever. But yeah, so it's available to people. In reality, reality shows it's done a fair bit. You, By and large, producers would not do it as a way, in, in a way that's not emotionally true yeah. or to stitch people up because, you know, that can come back on you. But yeah, you you have a lot of reactions, and sometimes you do have to replace the reaction with um with a reaction that's similar. I don't know whether we've come down on the side of you or your wife in that particular answer, Bill. But Bill's I've, wife, yeah. But, what yeah, does okay. Bill say? Bill, well, he's, it's not clear. So I hope that the <laughs> yeah, come on, Bill. Bill and his Raise wife are you know th- th- that is the answer. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> I'm t- I'm Team Bill's wife. Yes. I have a question for you, Marina. I suspect you'll know this. Swiley Botton writes in. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Swiley. Um, she says, this week Sky announced a major new upcoming drama about Lockerbie starring Colin Firth. Uh, six months after Netflix and the BBC announced their own upcoming Lockerbie drama. Uh, Gillian Anderson is playing Emily Maitlis in Netflix's drama about the panorama Prince Andrew thing and Amazon are also doing their own version. Um, so why do broadcasters continue to produce shows about the same subject that are being made elsewhere? Surely our audiences aren't going to watch both. For example, she says, which is a good one, would you watch another post office scandal drama? Well, not I, um, a lot of them. There were quite a few um, that people were talking about it because it be- it became an issue about three years ago, say something like the post office, where people actually suddenly it started finally getting a small purchase in people's imagination. People thought we must do something about this. But in this case, because I think ITV had bought up Alan Bates and bought up his story and paid for the rights of that and also many of the characters involved, the others fell away because they simply couldn't complete, compete with that bought up content. And if you're doing a sort of true life story like that, that does matter. Um, it's really quite interesting how many, saying that people won't watch too, I mean, people sadly do watch too. And it's almost, you know, you remember there with the fire Festival, the sort of oh, thing yeah. that went completely wrong. I think Hulu had a documentary, maybe Netflix had a documentary. People watch both. And there's an awful lot of things where people will watch the same thing. And it's slightly what we've been talking about before, that kind of al- algorithmic thing that serves you up the same sort of content. You know, customers who like this also like. And so people don't regard it. Once they've invested a certain amount, they might find out that other people have 
a similar project or a project in the same space, but they've invested a lot of money and, you know, they have to believe that theirs will be better. What I can't slightly stand is that, you know, when it's something like We Work or Theranos, the Elizabeth Holmes thing, you get the book, then you get sort of three competing documentaries, then you get the drama. And I, I really feel like, yeah, I think I'm on the point of being across this particular story now, which, by the way, only happened three years ago. So that, I don't like that particular vogue for things at the moment, but it can really spur you on. Um, I've talked to Stephen Frears about this, and he said that when he was directing Dangerous Liaisons, Milos Forman, who, who had Oscars for Amadeus, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and he was making a film called Valmont, which was coming out really quickly behind them. And in fact, could, should have come out before, but they said to him, how quickly can you start? And he said, um, Tuesday. <laughs> and they were like, great. As long as you can get it out before Milos's film, then you're good to go. And he did. And, and, and I, for me, it's the far superior film. But sometimes there's a play that's been out and it becomes a sort of cultural moment. And people think, I want to bring this to the screen or I want to bring this to TV. And it becomes a race. But it's interesting. People do watch two of the same. Mm. And that's something we can see. But I'm not crazy about the vogue for repetition of it all. And is, is it a thing where, where studios or streamers don't want to blink first, where it's a massive game of bluff and they've already sunk enough money in that they want the other... They, yeah. they, they want the other project to disappear. And they've got big names involved. For example, in the um, Newsnight, the Prince Andrew interview, they've got big names involved in both of those productions and nobody, they're going to do both. But I, as I say, the market suggests that people will watch both. Uh, it's like when they have the Hatton Garden heist and there's like four movies. Yeah. I think I've watched all of them. Yes. I think I have. When the um, Rebecca Vardy and Colleen Rooney thing came out, which, by the way, was brilliant as a real-life court battle that you could follow every day. I had no interest in sort of seeing it on TV, and I didn't watch it, but I was asked by four different people to write that. Four different producers asked me to write the drama of that, and to each of them I said, "I'm, you know, funny enough, I was working on something in a slightly similar, tangentially related space, but I also felt... It was great as it existed in real life. And I think Channel 4 did one and it sort of fell away. And, and that's because, yeah, if, some, if something's in our culture, then 30 people will be pitching yeah. that. I mean, they and they, I mean, they really will. But I would say that with TV shows all the time. And someone says, I've got an idea. You think, but it's if, if it's an idea that's about something current, every single it's in company the ether. will be. Yeah. It's like traitors. Every single company has pitched their version of Mafia or Wink Murder or whatever you want to call it. Every single company has done it. And it's been on a number of times. Well, speaking of pitching, I really want to ask this one to you, Richard, because it's from Harry Salmon and he's 12. So he, in my view, is a future format king. Hey, Harry. He comes with a question to you and it is, how easy is it to pitch an idea for a quiz show to a TV channel? Can you share any tips for creating one? That's a, that's a very, very... Good question. Our thing has always been with, with, with quiz shows. There are two types of quiz shows, ones that are fun to play and ones that are fun to watch. Uh, and what I would do, if you have an idea for a quiz, and it's always, Harry, it's thinking, do I want to give away a lot of money or do I want to start with 10 contestants and find the cleverest person? You know, So work, work out what that basic structure is uh, and then just come up with a with a series of rounds. And you do that just by getting your friends together, write a few questions, Whenever we do a quiz, we just play it again and again and again and again. And every time you play it, you have a different little idea and that can change things. Um, so keep playing it, keep playing it, keep playing it. If you have a great one, and that's to show that A, people enjoy playing. So afterwards, say to your friends, did you enjoy playing that? And if they all said yes, but also that people enjoyed watching. So have people along just watching the audience and say, was that exciting for you? And if you get to the stage where people enjoy playing it and people enjoyed watching it, then... Uh, yeah, you just have to go pitch it to a TV channel, which at the age of 12 is going to be hard, Harry. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that. But in the world of YouTube and stuff, you can film your own yeah. things these days. And if it's compelling and if it's interesting uh, and people love watching it, then more and more people will start watching it and then TV channels will start getting interested. Were you thinking of things like this at his age? Thinking, I'm afraid I was. Yes. Um, yeah. Did you have an exercise book where you wrote them all down yeah. and think, oh. I did. Oh. I was loving it because I love sport and I love yeah. I love the idea with sport that you have all these different formats. Like, you know, the FA Cup is a knockout. Yeah. So oh, you have to start with 128 teams. Then it's got, then it's 64, then it's 32. So I knew all that. And a league is everyone's got to play against everyone and, you know, certain points and certain points you don't get and everyone's got to play each other twice because otherwise you know everyone's got to play all the other teams once otherwise it's uh it's not fair uh, and then you know like, things like the Ryder Cup and I see how the points scores worked yeah. in that and you know I just apply that to quizzes and you know quizzes are sport that's that's 
all they are. It's it's taking a group of people and finding a winner and there being a prize. And, and I love your theory that sort of pretty much everything is sport. I mean, pretty much. Award, so far, things that have been sport on this podcast are awards, reality TV, reality TV and now quizzes. Yeah, and sport. Yeah, sport uh, itself. It's also sport. The, the, um, the original sport. Yeah, exactly. The in, sport. In a lot of ways. Yeah. In a lot of ways, it's the original sport. So, yeah, uh, something that has a little bit of jeopardy, a little bit of excitement. William G. Stewart, who was who was a, a great quiz master and quiz producer, he used to present 15 to 1. Um, this is very good about about questions. He said, um, and anyone who's doing a pub quiz or anything like that, this this is useful. They say, when you hear the answer to a question, you should either say, yeah, I knew that, or you should say, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, and if you get that in every every question, then you're you're laughing. But just play, just play, just play, 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 and hone, 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 and you know, have fun with it, Harry. That's a great question, and good luck as well. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you, Marina. Very good. Um, Kathy Clugston says, "Radio is a form of entertainment that is often left out of discussions. That is very true. Its demise has often been predicted, but it somehow survives. I wondered what your thoughts were on the future of linear radio." Given the podcast explosion, the podcast uh, explosion, the, podcast explosion. the emergency <laughs> the podcast emer- explosion. Well, this is very interesting um, because linear radio is far from dead. People don't want it to be dead for a start. 12% of the BBC's entire consumption happens in cars. Wow. It's, it's extraordinary. People are listening to the radio in cars. Um, funnily enough, 85% of BBC TV consumption is completely linear. Yeah, Which is, again, crazy, like is huge, one right? of the mistakes people often make when they're talking about media is to imagine that they are representative. And just yeah. because you like to get lots of podcasts or you like to watch everything on Catch Up, most people don't. But we're talking about radio. So to go back to that, people actually want what's called a sort of lean back experience. People like their car, turning on their radio in the car. A, po- a podcast is an act of choice. And you may think, right, I'm going to go and walk the dog. I want to listen to a specific podcast. Please make it this one. Uh, but um, <laughs> well, or the, any well, of the great rest is stable. To, to be fair, if anyone heard that, they are. They yeah, are actually yeah, listening. Maybe already they, doing they already it. They already did. Maybe, maybe the, already the worst it. people to advertise to are people who are already You're enjoying your product. Yes, yeah. I, I must get the hang of this, mustn't I, Richard? <laughs> Uh, But um, people want to sort of lean back and they want to be able to turn on the radio in the kitchen and something happen. Linear radio is what happens in the background if you're doing something else. And people have a lot of time in their lives when they are sort of having to do other things and they'd quite like to just be able to switch something on and a channel or whatever to be happening. So what you've got then, your issue is the devices. And the devices in this case are technically the car, which is the device which is delivering this into you, or what used to be people's kitchen radios and are increasingly becoming smart speakers, which are owned by Amazon, Google, whoever. Now, what unfortunately is happening is that there is no incentive for Volkswagen or for Google to make radio front and centre in the dashboard of the car because they can't monetize it. They're not interested in radio because they can't monetize it. They can maybe do deals with Spotify or things like that. So they, they are not, it's not in their interest. Exactly the same with the smart speakers. Now, smart speakers are coming through on to, you know, into the market far quicker. Cars take a long time to wash through. You don't get rid of your car. You, know, you don't keep your car for a long time. And so radio is front and centre in most dashboards still. But that might change. So yet again, radio is a really big battleground and it's a battleground against, in my view, some of the sort of pretty awful companies um, and it's all via the devices. So it's... So when you when you say that might change, you mean that, that, that car companies would start producing cars without an inbuilt radio and so you weren't able to access... Well, they might do a deal themselves. With, they're not going to do a deal with the BBC, obviously, but they might well do a deal with um, Amazon, Spotify, all these different, which allows them to put their things front and centre and easily, most easy to select. And they are try, but people don't want that. No. But it might be what they're given. But um, oh my God, I would people don't want linear radio to die at all. It is literally the tech companies and it will become the car companies who are the battleground on this. This is something I would take to the barricades for. Absolutely. If you can't get the radio. Yeah. In the, I mean, radio to me, linear radio comes down to this. Would I put on Ready to Go by Republica? Probably not. If it comes on the radio, am I like, yes! yes! That's the world of curation got, for you. Once again, the world of curation. We need to start Good lobbying question. the car companies yes. to say, keep, keep Vernon Kay in my car, this- <laughs> please. Keep, please keep this Lisa Tarbuck in my is car. is the hill I will die on. Exactly. Thank you so much for listening again. Are we done? I think we are. I think we are. But please keep your questions coming in because they're so good. I mean, there are so many brilliant ones. The email address is the rest is entertainment at gmail.com and we are here every week, so please keep asking. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. See you next time. See you next time. Bye.